VO in Stereo is sponsored by Bodalgo, international voice acting platform. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to VO and Stereo. As always, I'm your host, Jared Brushers, joined with ex- super producer extraordinaire, Stephen Coghill. I had to stutter on that one because it's just so great. Thank you. Well, today you heard Bucky the Squirrel, maybe some uh, Luke Skywalkers and video games. Um, today we're talking to the pig, not a pig, the pig. Please help me welcome world famous voice actor, Bob Bergen. Whee! By the way, it's Bergen, not Bergen, but that's Bergen. okay. Bird. You know, he always, he I mean, always mispronounces butcher. everyone's name. It's just kind of a thing, so it's fine. Mm-hmm. Not a problem. We've been doing a lot of Icelandic people lately. That's what it is. <laughs> that's, yeah. So that's that's probably where it went. Uh, so we'll go with the first question. Uh, what planet are you from? Uh, I believe I believe Earth, but, you know, you never know. Is it a reality or not? Ooh, red pill, blue pill. There you go. Over to Steven. That's crazy. <laughs> Well, thanks for being here and dealing with Jared's intro. Um, (laughs) My first question, which is the first question to everybody, is where are you from? I am originally from St. Louis. Missouri. Yeah. Beautiful. Did you grow up there? Is that where they do the chili and spaghetti? No, that's Cincinnati, where I actually moved to when I was eight. Oh. Not Ah. much. Dad took a job there. I mean, they didn't say leave child, you're eight, go away. <laughs> and so then we went to Cincinnati and we've been in LA. I've been in LA since I was 14. Very cool. Nice. So do you remember growing up in Missouri? Uh, I do. Yeah, very well. In fact, I, it's so weird. I left when I was eight, but I still consider it my hometown. So I very, very much. And I, uh, I miss it. And I need to go back just to see what's still there that I can remember. That's fun. Did you I always uh, like that? I'm here in Georgia and like you drive around to old neighborhoods I lived in. So it's kind of nostalgic, but I don't have to travel to a different state. I right. Guess. But I definitely get what you're talking about, like going back and seeing what's changed. Cause sometimes that'll happen where you're driving through, you're like, where did that come from? And there's a or, skyscraper. Or, or, or what you thought was enormous when you were a child, you're like, that's it. Or 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 you're driving someplace, you're like, wait, this took forever to get there when I was a kid. <laughs> this was only a five minute drive. That's ridiculous. Right. Patience. Time yeah. and space, it's all relative. Yeah. So did you, do you have uh, uh, brothers and sisters growing up? I have an older sister. And uh, did you guys grow up like creatively uh, or was it nope. like? Nope. nope. What's nope. Like, what type of, what type of household did you grow up in? Uh, very uh, traditional, normal parents married over 50 years. Uh-huh. Uh, and I was the only one in the family that wanted to be in show business. And did you know that from when you were a kid? Yep. I knew that since I was about five years old. I knew exactly what I wanted to do for my career. And what what were things were you doing at five years old to entertain? I was watching cartoons and I was memorizing cartoons and I was mimicking cartoons and I was tape recording cartoons. And at a very young age, I said to my parents, I think there's one guy doing every Looney Tunes voice. I can hear something similar in each of these characters. And, you know, when you're a five-year-old kid, you can't necessarily read credits that well. But I heard something in these voices that was the same guy. So then I became obsessed with the people that did the voices for the cartoons. And at a very young age, um, you know, I would research, oh, that's Dawes Butler. Oh, that's June Foray. Oh, that's Janet Waldo. Oh, that's, uh, that's Frank Welker. Uh, that's Don Messick. So I just immersed myself in this world of cartoons and cartoon voiceover. That is quite impressive. Looney Tunes. To have that mindset at that young to know at that, like, that's what you wanted to do. That's what you wanted to create. And but you know what? When I, when I lived in St. Louis, I was I was in at, at school and um, in Little League with Lou Brock Jr. Oh. And, and his dad was obviously Lou Brock. And um, I remember asking, he said, we were in Indian guides together. And, and I remember asking Lou Brock, um, when did you know you wanted to be a baseball player? He said, as soon as I could hold a ball when I was a child. I think you know. And, and, you know, kids that don't know, 
that's why there's college. So you go taste what the world has to offer. But I think those of us who are very successful at what we do, no matter what that is, um, early on, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. It doesn't matter what your outside influences are. It doesn't matter if you've got parents who say, no, you can't do that. If you're meant to do it, you're going to do it no matter what. Damn. I really like that outlook. Well, the Looney Tunes, they seem to inspire a lot of people. I mean, that Mel Blanc is just, you know, he inspired just a whole generation of voiceover. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's just been a running theme on our show that everyone's like, oh, Looney Tunes and Mel Blanc and just mm -hmm. amazing people. Um, cartoons yeah, seem cartoons. to be a real place of solace and good memories to like a lot of the actors. And we've talked about it a lot that, you know, even the comedians too, they've got to go through quite a bit to be as good as they are or to experience a lot of not said trauma, I guess, drama, trauma, or however you want to put it, however you want to label it, but they've gone through quite a bit and they know how to take it and kind of manipulate it in a way that serves them, which is fantastic. So being able to do that from a young age is pretty important and have something to rely on like Looney Tunes where it helps you escape. Also, like, cause cartoons, who here doesn't have a cartoon that really impacted their life? Yeah, and I, I wouldn't say I used it as an escape. I used it as a, a source of research um, and, and, and pure enjoyment. I mean, I enjoyed watching cartoons and there were a lot of cartoons I didn't like. But, and so funny, the ones I didn't like tended to not have voices. I was not a Tom and Jerry fan. I was not a Roadrunner Coyote fan. I was not a Pink Panther fan. Um, and I don't think because they, I found them uh, without voices, I just didn't like, it just didn't appeal to me. Uh, I was a huge black and white Fleischer Popeye fan. Love the old Popeyes. Those were, those were my, I think probably even more than Looney Tunes, my favorite cartoons. Well, growing up, you know, we had three channels we had to choose from. So, you know, exactly. Oh programming yeah. Programming was limited. And, and you know what, whatever it landed on, Hey, it's speed racer right now. I'll, I'm there. I'll watch it. It's good. Jim, Jim. Exactly. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. It's definitely a part of every day coming home from school cartoons saturday morning cartoons exactly exactly it's not it wasn't on demand we have to explain it to the children all the time oh my gosh and, you, and we don't even have um you know a, a lot of the christmas specials and and cartoon specials because people can watch them remember when the wizard of oz was on every year and it was like must see tv and if you missed it you missed it right. until next year yeah. well you can just watch it anytime you want now that's what you Put try on to explain YouTube, next or flitter you try it's to just, explain this to kids and they're like, what do you mean you missed it? Come I know, on. I know, I know. And I remember when we got our first uh, Betamax and I was like, I can tape record, I can record television. Oh, this is like amazing. And you know, I, who would who would have fathomed, you know, you're, I'm on the phone, oh, I can watch something while I'm on hold. You know, it's just, it's a different world that kids only know, which is, true. you know, amazing. Very true. What? It's like watching the old movie, The Beastmaster, if you remember that one, and like with Moto and Kodo, the little ferrets that ran around. And it, my kids are like, how in the world did you watch? Because it's the VHS quality 80s film. And I'm like, this was golden. I was like, this yeah. was top edge cutting. And then, then we go to watching the new Dune and we're like, all right, I get where you're coming from, but bear with me. This is 40 years ago. And I'm like, oh my God, it was 40 years ago. <laughs> Try not to think like that. Right. It's, it's a bad road. So uh, did you go, did you, did you, you went to high school in, uh, in what state? In California. We moved here when I was 14. So junior right. last so, year. So in high school, were you like in drama and all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. and really yeah. I, the arts? We had a TV production class I was involved in. And I started studying voiceover outside of school when we first moved to LA. So I studied voiceover for, age 14 to 18. Uh, I did two years at an acting conservatory, three years of, of improv. So the moment we, we landed here, I started pursuing my career. Wow. But back then they wouldn't hire you if you were a kid, unless it was a peanut special. Back then you had to be over 18. So I didn't even try to get work. I just wanted to learn the business and become a good actor. See, that's amazing, that tidbit right there, because I'm guessing around that time, so many people said there was not resources back then or there wasn't classes and you like when you hit the ground you hit the ground running well there were resources there was a, there were there were trade magazines one was called drama log which is now backstage and it advertised oh. classes and theater auditions and things like that and photographers so i just went to our local newsstand and picked up a drama log i also went through the yellow pages 
and would call Hanna-Barbera and call uh, uh, Filmation. And I, I, re I remember calling Filmation and some very nice, I don't know what she even did, but she gave me a tour of the studio and I, and I, and I met Lou Scheimer and she gave me a packet of animation cells about that thick as I was leaving. And she said, take these fast, don't tell anybody I gave them to you. And I got them somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I mean, I was just, again, if you wanted to be a baseball player, you know, in 1978, you're gonna call, <laughs> LA Dodgers, you're gonna call Steve Garvey, you know? I mean, I just pick up the phone and call people. How do I do this? I also got lucky. I found in drama log, really good legitimate voiceover classes. And my parents, we had a rule, I had to keep a C average. If I kept a C average in school, then they would pay for my voiceover classes, which were in the evenings. And uh, yeah, I kept a C average, but that was about it. I was, I, it was barely a C average. So no Harvard, no Yale, no MIT? No, nothing. I actually graduated <laughs> high school and became a tour guide at Universal Studios. But I told my parents I was going to Cal State Northridge and part-time. And um, I actually went to the school store and bought the books and pretended to go to school every day for a, just not that long, for about six weeks. And then my mom caught on. And then she got <laughs> pissed at me that I wasted all that money on the books. Ooh. Because I'm, the books are not cheap. But, Ooh. you know, I had a Jewish mother. And you don't, you don't piss off a Jewish mother by not going to college. But I kept saying, look, college is not going to teach me um, how to be Looney Tunes, how to, how to work in animation. Uh, if anything... If I haven't, people say, do you have any regrets? My regrets would probably be that I didn't do New York for a couple of years and do theater uh, as an actor. And if college, yeah, you know, Juilliard, uh, Yale Drama School, I didn't have the grades to get in, but I would have loved to have lived the college life and studied theater in college. But I got my first agent and my first job a week out of high school. So not, none of this would have happened had I taken that course. Yeah, it doesn't seem like you made the wrong decision. I mean, a lot of times on the show, we find out that people have their own. It's true. It rings true on every single person. And you hear it and you think it's just cliche that everyone has their own path and their individual journey. It's true. There's yeah. similarities out there, but everyone takes a different path. I don't have regrets. I mean, you know, I, I'm very, very pleased with where how things ended up. But, you know, just from a life experience regret, it would have been fun to have gone to college. It would have been fun to have, you know, it's early in the morning, packing up my backpack to go to stand in line to go to theater auditions before I go wait tables. I mean, that life of an actor that I never experienced, I kind of wish I had, even though it sounds horrible in my 50s, it sounds like it would have been exciting in my 20s. Well, anytime you're in Georgia and you get the itch, I'll find a construction site we can go to and we can we can scratch that itch for you out there. That that's that's like that's about as good as waiting tables. That's that's, that's a fun life. I can't wait. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, just that's my background real from that. quick. Ooh, that was horrible. <laughs> that's hilarious. So you said you got out of high school. You had you already had an agent and you had um you already were doing Amazing. a voiceover career like that's crazy what's what sort of things were you doing well it took me about five years from first job first agent to working actor um i was really just auditioning and hit or miss booking i mean i was making i was making a living as a tour guide at universal studios and any other odd job i could have i was a mall santa claus during the holidays and i would i was I was just taking any job that paid the bills. And when I would book a voiceover job, um, I would bank that. So Smart. I was five years as a tour guide. My last year, I had 32 sick days because I was booking a lot of voiceover work. And this was before home studios. I mean, I, I, this was the day of pagers. So I would be on the middle of a tour and my pager would go off. It was my agent. And I was, I remember one time we were right in front of Believe It's a Beaver House on the back lot. And I knew there was a payphone in there. So I said to the driver, stop in front of the Beaver House. I got to make a phone call. And he said, okay. So um, I said, on the mic, I said to the folks, I said, let me see if Mrs. Cleaver has some cookies for us. And I walked in the, in, in the front door, which was, it was just a false front. And there's a payphone in the back for, for the crew. And I called my agent and I booked a series and life was good. So they ended up firing me because of 32 sick days. And I was panicking because I said, well, what if my voiceover career just kind of dies? And they said, well, you can come back if you need to, but we can't afford to keep you here and keep replacing you over and over and over again. And as it turned out, um, 
I had banked in five years, two years worth of living expenses in my voiceover work from rent to you know car payments and insurance and food. I had at least two years of living expenses. So I thought, okay, this is, this is meant to be. I'm going to pursue full-time voiceover and at least for two years and see what happens. And I never looked back. It was, it was, I mean, let me put it this way. So the life of an actor has ebbs and flows, but that was in 87 and I bought my first condo in 1990. So things went well. Right here, the link to his oh. masterclass. <laughs> That's not okay. a bad idea. The Bob, Bob Bergen, Bergen masterclass. masterclass. That'd be amazing. <laughs> It's probably like, I already do a master class. Like, Dang it. I was going to say, I do teach, but yeah. <laughs> oh, we're going to make sure we get all that information for all the viewers. Absolutely. We do that at the end, but absolutely. We're not going to let all these gems go. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I have an interesting question. You know, a lot of people are all about sunshine and rainbows and, oh, here's where we get the gold. And um, <laughs> let me know about something, if you don't mind, where you completely fell. You failed. It, it just wasn't good. It, it just... You know, took the wind out of your sails, however you want to put it. But, uh, you know, something that you had to pick yourself up from and keep moving on. Something that was really quite Well, yeah, you also then have to define fail because, you know, uh, an actor's job is to audition. I audition for 10 to 20 things a day, depending on the day. I probably won't book any of them. Is that mm-hmm. a failure? No, my job is to audition. Yeah. But I don't go in. I'll, I'll show you guys. That's my, my, my booth right there. That's where I spend my days, eight to 10 hours a day in that room, trying to get work or working. And, um, you know, um, I don't audition to try to get the job. Getting the job doesn't even enter my mind. I don't care if they like me. I don't care. I'm, I'm just all about having fun in that booth and being mm-hmm. creative. I got into this business to have fun and be creative. Getting the job is a fortunate circumstance. We have all had ups and downs. Um, I don't care. I honestly I have never, you know, if, if, you, if it's that, you know, hey, you're, it's between you and somebody else, they chose somebody else. Um, that's okay, I'm doing something else anyway. I mean, I've never really um, dwelled upon negatives because that is, so, if you look at social media right now, it is a cesspool mm-hmm. of group therapy and everybody complains and everybody bitches and moans and everybody's looking for an E pat on the back, it's okay. We all love you anyway. And I think that is the detriment of success. People are looking for acceptance. Is it okay to be a failure? No, it's not okay to tell everybody you are. So there's no reason to advertise. I did a, um, an all day Saturday VO workout group when I was about 16, 17 with Jack Angel, who just passed away. Uh, Don LaFontaine, Danny Dark, Steve Schatzberg, Ernie Anderson came in every once in a while. And the best education that we had was during lunch, where they would just give me bits of advice and uh, war stories. And some of the best advice, one of them was um, always carry yourself as a successful working voice actor and never break character. Let the world think you're working and they're going to keep hiring you. Walk around with doom and gloom, make excuses, complain, uh, and nobody wants to be with you. Social media has become nothing but a cesspool of, I deserve this and complain. And it's a victim thing. And it's, it's, it's sad, it's depressing, and you can't succeed that way. You cannot succeed that way. That's something that I think has come up recently in quite a few of the threads that I've seen is this influx of all these new aspiring voice actors. And they're like, there's a couple of us that have been grinding for a while that grind daily and don't know that it's continuous daily grind. You say, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be a voice actor. Well, my grandmother told me I had a great voice. Well, my mom calls me son, but it's not because I'm bright. There's a lot of work to do. I was ignorant. I thought just because I could do a bunch of different voices, a lot like you grew up doing it, you know, mocking, mimicking everything. And I thought they're just going to give me the golden ticket. And then I got there, they're like, whoa, 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 what's your business plan? Where's your website? Uh, how many demos do you have? Do you have agents? It's it like, whoa, whoa, you mean I got to learn all this stuff to function as a voice actor? And it's now you're seeing all this, like you're saying back, like, well, why isn't it happening for me? Well, well there's a also, lot of work that goes into it. The internet is, is filled with make money at voiceover. Now, when I studied voiceover, nobody talked about making a dime, how to make a dime. Nobody talked about the business of the business. It was all about craft. When you worked, that was up to you. The class is gonna teach you what to do with the mic. The class is gonna teach you how to take the words on the script and bring them to life. 
getting work, that's outside the class. But people are saying, take my class and make money. And people are telling new actors, new students, ask what their, the, the teacher's success rate is. Who, who did they, who studied with them, who's working? Who cares? The majority of the people who studied with Stella Adler or Lee Strasberg or Sandy Meisner never made a dime as an actor. And all three of those legendary acting coaches, if anybody came in and, and raised their hand and says, let's talk about money, they would kick them out of the class. Because it's not about money, but because of the internet, voiceover today, it's all about the money, which is why people are willing to take $5 to do a commercial because I got paid doing what I love. And listen, I'm on the air. Isn't that great? Well, no. well, it's great for them because they find value in it. But then they wonder why they can't take their career to the next level because they, they've dumbed down the business over the last five years. And they've made it difficult for the uh, upper tier agents to take on. I mean, listen, my agent, my first agent took me on when I said, what's a SAG card? I mean, I've been studying voiceover for four years and nobody said, talked about the business. And I didn't understand how that worked. And I remember when I got my first job and I was taft hardly into SAG. And I, I think I got three something for the job and I had to pay six something for the SAG card. And I called my agent and I said, do I have to buy a SAG card every time I work? Because there's, there's no profit in this. I don't understand how that works. <laughs> and, he, and, and, he, and he said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. And he goes, well, well, you do have to go down and join after now. I said, what? Another one? <laughs> but, but um. I just didn't know because it was considered um, a huge, tacky, unethical red flag for, a, for an acting teacher, a voiceover teacher to discuss income in a class. And I've never talked about making a dime in, in, in animation in my classes. Animation is the only voiceover contract today that is still over 90% union. So when someone says, what can you make? And I'm like, nothing or a million or more. And everything in between. If you work, you get scale plus 10. That's like it. Look. When you're at a convention and they point themselves out that they're not even going to last five seconds in the business because this one lady, she had raised her hand. I think it was at Vio Atlanta. And she was like, I need to know the fastest way, the shortest way to make the most money. I was like, oh, oh, oh. You just kept throwing red flags on the football field. You are out of here. Well, my yeah. answer to that would be prostitution. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's the and, quickest, money. By the way, there's a whole different kind of mic technique for that. But, you know, whatever, whatever works. Why do you for think you. I have the road? Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Um, no, it's, it's, you know, I, 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 I don't blame the people who want it fast and cheap because that's what the internet is telling them to do. That's what every, that's voice one, two, three, that's voices.com. That's make money at your, at, at, at voiceover. That's what you see all over the internet. And, you, you know, people, money at everyone's expense. Well, right? and people study with me, they know, I always tell my students from the get go, first of all, it's just my opinion. If it doesn't work for you, I'm, I'm not going to test you. My feelings aren't hurt. <laughs> everybody and form your own technique. That's what I did. But I'm not going to um, sugarcoat. I'm, I'm, I'm supportive. I'm, I'm your biggest cheerleader. I'm going to work you at the mic until I think you've gone beyond your comfort zone. But I'm not going to lie to you. I've never told any student, don't pursue this because lousy actors get lucky breaks every day. And who am I to tell somebody, don't try? But what I will tell them is, save your money on voiceover right now. You need acting classes. You need improv classes. You have no technique under your belt. Don't waste your money at the mic with voiceover until you become a solid actor. That's what I see. And that's what a trend that really bothers me in the industry mm -hmm. is like, even with the conventions, you go to these conventions, kind of like you hit on just a few minutes ago, you see a marketing class and you see a beginning voiceover class and you see dialect class and you see this class There's all these different classes about voiceover, but you see not even one or two acting classes, which is the core of what we do. And there are no performance classes or they're like, oh, they're treated as an afterthought. Right. It's like, that is the core of this business. Mm -hmm. And you're teaching them the business of the business before you're teaching them the core. And then you're wondering why you've got 5,000 people running going, well, what the hell am I doing now? Or, or people will go out and buy a road mic and they'll have Source Connect and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I was on a panel at Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con a few years ago, sitting next to Dee Baker. And somebody raised their hand and said, what kind of an investment do I need to be a beginning voice actor? And... D said, what's your experience? He goes, well, none. I just need, you know, to be able to record. And D said, I love him yeah. for this. He said, you don't buy a tuba and apply to an orchestra. 
Okay. <laughs> if you purchased it doesn't mean you can do it. I mean, I, for me, it was a little portable tape recorder. That was what I used. Um, I've had this booth for almost 20 years where I held, I did auditions, but it wasn't until COVID until I had to work in it because we didn't ever record animation from home. And then when COVID hit March 12th, I think was the lockdown, I think. And by the end of March, I was up and running with a broadcast quality home studio. And it, the, the, this 18, 19 months of COVID has been the busiest of my career because early on I showed the studios and the casting directors and the producers and the showrunners, I'm, I'm yours, I'm good to go. Here are my samples. And all the agents were sharing sound samples with all the casting directors. And those of us who are up and running fast, book, 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 book. It's been amazing. In fact, I can't keep track. It's, I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying that. Uh, and I don't ever expect to go back in the studio if I don't have to. There's no reason to. I've been in the studio once during COVID, and that was because I had a song to sing. But that's it. I don't think I want to go back again. If you and have a I, song in your heart, you'll always have a song to sing. <laughs> for scale plus 10. It definitely uh, changed the business, you know, COVID. Uh, completely yeah, it did. The it, it, business on its head, yeah. It's changed the world and how things are done. It's just there. we proved that you don't have to, like there doesn't have to be as much social interaction to get these things done. Sometimes it's nice to have intimate settings and, you know, gatherings, but for in a majority, we've proven that we don't have to do that, which is kind of dangerous at this point since everybody is so disconnected any damn way. Like it's like we're getting more disconnected, but we've also proved that it can be a positive disconnection at the same time. Well, I we also kill ourselves out there. I also I also think that um, uh, for us in L.A., the drive time that we don't have to deal with between sessions, I can work more during the day. Um, I do miss interaction with my fellow castmates. But even before COVID, we were doing a lot of, of our of our parts solo just because we all have busy schedules. Um, so it's not as different uh, from that standpoint, but acting is reacting. When you do an animated feature, you're never with a cast, ever. So uh, that's that's not changed. But uh, people have this, this um, I was gonna say delusion, but it's a, that's a horrible word that, oh, because of COVID, now I can live anywhere and do cartoons. Not yet. Perhaps one day, but not yet. And a lot of it is because of the time difference. Because I, I, I have a standing job once a week from 4 to 6 p.m. Well, that's 7 to 9 if you're in New York. And nobody out here is going to risk that an actor is going to be full of energy by not, at, 9, at 9 p.m. So um, that, and there's so many people here to choose from who are out of work. So I say not yet, but perhaps one day. Atlanta's growing. Yeah, but a lot of it's non-union. That's yeah. true. And, and the majority- Because I'm non-union at the moment. Well, but the majority of mainstream animation is union. union. True. Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool that it's, it's branching out and the technology is giving a chance that a different markets can grow slowly as it may be. But I think it's what the major ones are, New York, Atlanta, in California, that's yeah. that's about it, right? I think yeah. there's some in Florida, but that's like EA and where they're hubbed at for video games, I believe. I don't know because I do EA games out here all the time, so I don't think it it because the animation game actors are out here. So corporate, it doesn't matter where corporate is; it matters where the actors who do the product are. Do you do any um, motion capture stuff? You've done any of that? By choice, I've been asked to, but all right, just curious. Uh, a, I don't ever want to memorize if I don't have to. And you have to memorize. <laughs> yeah. I also look lousy and like, I mean, the idea of putting on that skin tight suit with dots that is creatively doesn't that. I also don't do audiobooks. Um, you know, I only do what I find creatively fulfilling, but mocap. No. Audiobooks are tough. Audiobooks are tough. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'd want to be in a spandex suit either. That's a bad image <laughs> right, on that one. Right. Whoever, whoever, I don't know how many years ago decided, hey, here's a great deal. Let's get paid for the finished edited hour for audiobooks. Whoever said yes to that originally and just ruined it for everybody else. It's the only VO contract I know of where you're not paid for your time and that, you ha you're, that you're forced to edit your own work. Um, and I don't, I don't want to sit in a booth and read a book that I wouldn't read for enjoyment. That doesn't do it for me, but I've got friends 
they live, they wake up every day excited about their next audiobook project. So God bless them. There's something for everybody and there's everybody for something. I agree. That's what's beautiful True. about VO is there's so many different avenues and yeah. branches and it's like nobody even thinks thinks about that really until yeah. you get into it and you go, what do you mean? You can, you know. Right. I'm sure it's different there in, you know, Hollywood, but here in Georgia, you know, it's still some places where you tell them, I'm a voice actor. What do you do? What is that? And my explanation I give a lot of people is like, you know, when you you don't see the commercial but you hear the commercial i was like a lot of that i was like imagine that now across all media and entertainment they're like oh that's a job i'm like where do you think the sounds are coming from <laughs> you know <laughs> somebody's got to do it how do i get that i mean i totally i totally respect that why would they know what it is unless they were involved in it? then they think it's the coolest thing well how do i do it and it's like oh <laughs> well then i usually i usually just say are you an actor or, or I'll get people calling me for my workshops. You know, um, I want to do voices for cartoons, but I don't want to act. And I'm like, well, that's like saying I want to do ballet, but I don't want to dance. You know, it, it, it's it, it's acting. I want to be a five star chef, but I ain't cooking shit. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Give me the Michelins. Where's my sous chefs? Right. No, that's hilarious. God, that's funny. <laughs> I got a, I got I got one for you. So, uh, if you ruled the world. What would your number one rule be and why? To end the cancel culture. And that's the end of our show. That's the best statement anyone's ever getting. We're canceling all you oh, canceling yeah. sons of bitches. Bye. Yeah. Dude, that's I, I would, if I had if I had the power and and and, and the, the ability to have people follow through, and I'm not I, I don't get political at all. But the can the cancel culture scares the heck out of me because you know change the channel don't go to the movie don't read the book but don't Ooh. burn don't ban the book and the pendulum is here right now it's far but uh, it, it needs to be here in the common sense of the middle but if, if this is the cancel culture today when the pendulum shifts over here they're going to be canceled too because that's what the cancel culture will go away, but the pendulum will swing. So don't buy the product, but don't demand that the person who did what you don't like lose their life and livelihood. And we're living in a one strike, due process means nothing society. And it frightens me. And a lot of it to blame is social media. Comedians are well, because are you scared everybody's right on a witch hunt, constantly burning everyone down before they yeah. even get the oh, story yeah. or they do their own research. It's like the same people that are complaining about comedians, comedians whose job it is to take bad things and make light of them. Yeah. No matter if you like it or not, there's dude, comedians tackle everything. Well, here's, that's here's the, the same woman that's got the five year old in the back listening to who that twerk that hit that good that did, and it's just like. You can't even be a responsible parent to your five-year-old, but you want to bitch about because this person hurt your feelings? Yeah, and here's and here's the thing. You get two people in a room. You get a comic who's, who does their act for them. One's insulted, offended, and one thinks it's funny. Who's right? Not they're both, they're both right. It's subjective. So the one that doesn't like it, don't watch the comic. Also, we used to be able to laugh at ourselves. We used to be able to laugh at our differences and our similarities. I loved Joan Rivers. I loved Don Rickles. I love Mel Brooks. And Mel Brooks. I will always love that. And I'm able to laugh at myself. And self-deprecating humor is a joy. I'm also Jewish. We like to we like to laugh at ourselves because we're funny people. <laughs> funny, we're funny, uh, 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 silly. Uh, we've got issues. And God bless my family because just a holiday is worthy of laughing at ourselves That's every true. day yeah it makes things better it's like, I that, think got deeper than I, that got deeper than i've ever done in a voiceover uh, uh podcast well this is funny because we, it, that tends to happen here because yeah. we're just we, we like to talk about real normal things yeah real normal people and everybody wants to come on they want to ask you what microphone do you have what was your first job how much is it you know what i love you bob i love who you are what you stand for I don't care about any of that. I want to know you. And that's why we ask the certain questions that we ask because usually everyone's all about, like I said, rainbows and sunshine. Life is not rainbows and sunshine all the time. So we like real. So thank you for being real. Yeah, yeah. We do the little happy day. 
you have like a favorite joke or a limerick or something like a, a for instance or something you've happened during like live session improv that's just stuck with you the whole time no <laughs> I'm, that's, that's a boring answer how dare that. you how dare you hey, it's a real know. answer <laughs> no fire what was your first microphone i'm just don't change fire it, breathing but... fish no nothing like that okay. no <laughs> i'm just fire curious breathing. just curious <laughs> that's funny well you know we're going to come to the part where we're like oh what kind of advice would you give somebody to you know if they're starting off in the business so we'll go with that so you have a piece of advice or something that you've learned that just stands through to the test of time, no matter how much technology changes the industry, something that doesn't change. Uh, first of all, we covered it, study acting. Become a great actor, study improv, and then study voiceover. Know what you want out of your career. If it's the, I just want to work as a voice actor, you're not going to. You're one of the majority who aren't. They're walking in circles because they're not focused. Um, I didn't have the internet when I was starting out. Everybody has the ability to reach out to the major players. I reached out to the major players, but I used the phone book, you know, back in the old days. And I would crash recording sessions and watch people work. Um, don't hang around or ask advice uh, or network with those on the same or smaller boat as you. Go to the people who have the career that you want and emulate them. Who did they study with? Who did their website? Who did their demos? Uh, that's exactly what I did. That's another piece of advice that I got from uh, Don LaFontaine. Only rub elbows with the most successful. Hang around with them. All of a sudden, you're going to be one of them. You may not have the bank account to reflect that, but everyone's going to associate you with the number one, the, 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 the top tier. So... Stop asking advice from people who aren't doing the career that you want. Ask advice from the people who are uber successful. What did I do wrong here? What can I, I can remember one time um, I was at lunch in that workout group um, and I complained about missing out on an audition because I was, I was late and they might, they wouldn't let me read. And I was really pissed off at them. And oh my God, Don yelled at me like a father yelling at a child. He goes, hey, do you know how many people would have killed for that opportunity? You should have been there early. If you're a half hour early, you're a half hour late. Don't complain to us that they wouldn't see you because you messed up. Um, this is a competitive business. I worked hard to get to where I'm at. And I work even harder to stay here. Um, I'm always learning. I'm always, every once in a while, I'll take a class because I'm getting lazy or I'm just like, yeah, trends have changed in promos. I got to find out what I'm not, what I'm doing wrong today that worked yesterday. Um, want this more than anybody. Be willing to do more. One of my favorite words on the planet is earn. Don't think that you should be handed anything. Everything you get, you should work hard and earn. And if you stop working hard, then you should then you should stop deserving what you what you what you want because it, it's it's hard work until they bury it. It's true. I, that, thank you for tuning into the emotional evangelist hour with Bob Bergen. <laughs> no, that dude. That was all jokes aside. That was that was some of the best advice we've had on the show. Um, God. I think I think people should just throw money at this episode too because this there you go this is valuable information. When people just throw money at at random things, not so not just this. subscribe. But, that would be also be a nice thing. Oh, there you go. All right. See, I also reach also out to Bob for his uh, his um, you know his consultations expertise. and his counseling. Yeah, yeah. That's that's got a really long wait list. I'm not doing workshops anymore. <laughs> Okay, but don't that, don't contact him right now. He's no, very you can, busy. You, can, you can contact me. I'm happy to put you on the wait list, but it's long because so, I only do one or two a week. If I if that, just because I'm I'm busy, but uh, yeah. And and what's happened lately is I went I I went to the list to, to book a few people, and you know life happens. You know, hey, it's it's COVID. I'm not working. I can't afford it right now, so I have to go to the next one. But you know, just because it's a long list doesn't mean it's going to be as long as that list looks. Okay. Visuals. This is yeah. good. People need to know how busy Bob is, and Bob's a very busy man, and that's a good thing. It doesn't sound like you get a whole lot of time for any kind of thing other than voiceovers, but I do have one last question, and then I'll let Stephen kick it off or end it for us. Um, thank you. What is, 
Oh, I, I had my question and I totally forgot it. Oh, um, that's been our show. Or, I'm just kidding. Yeah, right. That was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> it was ridiculous. I'll hand it right back over to Steven so I can figure out what the hell I was going to say. I'm so this curious. You know? I know. <laughs> I, I now I want to know. So he's got to formulate. He's got to come back to it. Yeah. I, oh, you know what it is? Uh, what? Something that you actually right. get time to nerd out on. What? Like something other than voiceover that you get to nerd out on. Like I call them hobbies or nerding out. Or like I play Warhammer. I do tabletop gaming, stuff like that. I, like hate, what's something... I hate gaming. Um, okay. I've never seen a game I've ever voiced. Uh, I used to play Miss Pac-Man when I was a kid. I love Miss Pac-Man. Miss Pac-Man uh, awesome. I, Pong. I mean, I was, I was one of the first people to ever have Pong. I loved Pong. Uh, but okay. I don't, I'm not competitive. I don't like games. Um, I don't nerd out on anything. Um, I've never seen a Marvel movie, and I take that back. I've seen, I think, one of the Spider-Man movies. Um, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a nerd at all. I can remember I've done a lot of uh, uh, Star Wars product, projects. I'm doing one right now called The Bad Batch for, for Disney. <laughs> it's really fun. It's really fun. Um, but That's I, a great I, show, by the way. Isn't it cool? It um, really is. I did uh, the Robot Chicken specials, the Star Wars Robot Chicken specials. And um, they were blasts because they were, they were, you know, it's just farce. It was par- and after we did the first one, uh, George Lucas invited the cast and crew to Skywalker Ranch to premiere it. And I'm thinking, oh, this is cool. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not a geek. I'm not a Star Wars geek, but that was pretty cool. And as we were leaving, they handed each of us a lightsaber as a gift. And like I was a like, working I, one where you could like chop people in half or no? Nah, no, unfortunately it didn't work, but it does, it does make the, <laughs> ah, it lights up and it was exciting. really cool as we we're all flying back on Southwest airlines, we were all walking on with our lit lightsabers and you know, that was, that, that was, I didn't geek out at that, but I did kind of, that's eh, kind of cool. Nah, it's okay. kind of cool. All right. That's cool. I mean, come on. You went to Skywalker Ranch and walked over with the lightsaber. That's what do you mean, kind of cool? That's pretty. That's, well, that's I, well, definitely cool. George and, Lucas bequeathed you a lightsaber. Well, at the I, and, and, and and Jared, we went back another two times with the other two specials. So the second time, I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. And the third time, was like, what's the date? Yeah, all right, all right. I think I can make it. They gave so, you a Jawa okay, on okay. the way out. Here's a Jawa. Just take it home. Oh, make sure oh, to water oh, it. Feed oh, it. Sir. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. <laughs> Seriously, they had a really cool gift shop, and I was like, and I and I bought a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. But it was it's it was fun. There are some fringe benefits to doing what we do that mm-hmm. I didn't grant it at all. And you know, people are going to ask about your death masks in the back. I know they're not death masks, but this I'm like that. Life I masks. know. Would you just you explain before we hit record? But maybe you want to explain uh, the I, mask behind you. I, I it started, and I don't know why. I thought he might exist. But I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if there's a Mel Blanc life mask out there. And I went looking and I couldn't find Mel Blanc. But the first one I got was Hitchcock. And I was like, well, that's cool. So I saw I bid on auction. And if I get it, great. If I don't, I don't. I just ordered, I just got three new ones. I think I'm waiting for um, Dustin Hoffman and De Niro. But I only get masks of artists that I really, really, really admire. Uh, you know. Uh, oh, I'm gonna send you one. Don't worry about it, Bob. I got you. There you go. There you go. Send you uh, one. And you know, they're um, they're 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 life masks. So it's like having your uh, a celebrity over your shoulder at all times. It's kind of fun. So those are, so this is really what you geek out at. It's it's not. I admire uh, sabers and uh, I'm not geeky. I, I I just admire artists, you know. All right, I, I, okay. He doesn't want to admit he's geeking out on it, but you know. No, I really don't. <laughs> I'm just gonna say I don't geek, and I'm not. I'm not. I don't get starstruck, you know. I've, I've I'm on the board of governors of the TV Academy, and I've met a lot of just major major actors, and um, I I rarely, if ever, get starstruck. In fact, the people I would get starstruck starstruck at are no longer with us. I would get starstruck at Lucy. I would have gotten starstruck at Jack Lemmon. Um, but I would have gotten struck. Uh, I'll tell you where I get stars, where I get geeky. I do get geeky. I thought I figured that out. I get geeky at studios. Nice. Uh, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of working a few times at the Henson studios on La Brea, which used to be the Charlie Chaplin studios. And all of our work is in the Charlie Chaplin stage where modern times was shot. I mean, we're classic 
uh, uh, silent films were, were done. That's where I geek out. When, on my days off at Universal, I would wander the back lot. That's that's where I would be. I geek out on 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 Hollywood history. Nice. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, Superman for Hollywood by Hollywood. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Your awesome. story, dude. It was like you knew what you wanted to do and you went and did it. Yeah, I did. Mean, still doing it. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and still doing it. Like you said, working hard every day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I can't tell you thank you enough for your time. I'm a God, just, man, befuddled. Befuddled at all the volume of information and honesty, and I really do appreciate your time. Oh, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, not a problem. Mr. Steven, you want to close well, I just out? Sure. I'd just tell everybody where uh, they can find your fine self. You have a website? I'm oh, sure you do. Uh, right? Yeah, i got a website, bobbergen.com. Instagram is bergen.bob, and Twitter is at bobbergen, and I'm in the phone book. Seriously, there's You're no... The... <laughs> just look I Bob up. I mean, there's people who say I, I couldn't find you. I'm like, you didn't try. You didn't. <laughs> I like your uh, genie bottle in the back too. That's cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's real too. That's a gift from Christina Aguilera. That yeah. is yeah. a genie bottle. Come, come, come on in, let me in. That is a genie bottle. Nice. That is awesome. I love it. And I have to be very careful with it because don't I don't break you, it. No kidding, right? Don't break it. Yeah. I was hoping it wouldn't be one of those episodes where somebody says some dumb stuff and then it happens. I was like, please don't let that be right now. <laughs> I, I said it wasn't. Thank God. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that does it for another episode of VO and Stereo. Again, thank you so much for being here. I learned a lot. So if you didn't learn a lot, that's on you. It's like, your subscribe, problem. follow. You should have paid attention more yes. carefully. Pay attention. And be a decent human being. And remember, it's voice acting. Voice acting. Core. All right, everybody, till next time.